I'm Benita Shetty, founder of The Smart Citizen, and uh, it gives me great pleasure to launch a new summer series on Zoom called Conversations on Place Branding and Identity. When it comes to successful territorial branding, the ultimate end game is attracting capital and talent. Indeed, Wolf Olins, which launched the legendary New York City logo in 2007, said there was a 13% increase in visitor numbers, resulting in 370,000 more jobs for the city. 2008 became a record year with 47 million people visiting the city, generating $33 billion in visitor spending. At its most primitive, branding is synonymous with communication design, logos, visual identity, but while icons and typograms are important to conveying the look, feel, and tone of voice of the city, there are other elements that go into successful and comprehensive branding. And this is what we're hoping to unpack in this three-part series. Sharing the secret sauce as to what makes a good brand is our moderator, a seasoned brand strategist based right here in Barcelona. And uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Simon Patterson, who has spent the last 34 years creating, redefining, and strengthening brands around the world. His work spans a range of sectors, including hospitality, cities, airlines, energy, financial services, retail, media, technology, university, business, and design education and culture. His portfolio has included the recent rebranding of the Datai Lankawi, one of the world's most iconic hotels, NH Hoteles. He has been involved in a recent placemaking project in the city of Shanghai and in the old Spitalfields market in London. Other distinguished projects in his portfolio include Emirates Airlines, the Star, Star Alliance, United Airlines, Shell, Citigroup, Oxford University, INSEAD, National Museums in Liverpool, and Berry Brothers in Rudd, the 300-year-old British wine and spirit merchant. Simon is a member of the Medingue Group, a high-level international think tank on branding. Previously, he served on the advisory board of the Glasgow Collection, part of Glasgow um, 1999 UK City of Architecture and Design, and was visiting tutor to the Design Management MA program at the Royal College of Art. Simon has worked for and with many of the world's leading brand and design consultancies, including Wolf Olins, Addison, and Pentagram. His experience and expertise is fueled by innate curiosity about world business, society, and culture, and a passionate interest in branding, design, and communications. Over to you, Simon. Hello, thank you very much, Vinita. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to. Uh, uh, today we're going to be talking to two very experienced place branding strategists, Anupam Yog and Philip Slade. Welcome to both of you. Anupam is a creative strategist with experience in the competitive positioning of countries, cities, destinations, and places. Passionate about urban innovation, Anupam is an avid community organizer and champion of walkable cities. In 2018, he was invited by Singapore's Center for Livable Cities to join their Young Leaders Group. In a career spanning nearly two decades, Anupam has held leadership roles in high growth environments across the public, private, and social sectors. He has crafted and implemented global campaigns for Brand India, most notably at the World Economic Forum in Davos, successfully positioning India as the fastest growing free market democracy, campaigns also for Brand London in Beijing, Mumbai, and Delhi, and led economic diplomacy and investment marketing initiatives in the UK, the EU, USA, Japan, Brazil, China, and ASEAN countries. He has also successfully helped launch Virtuous Retail, an institutional property development company that owns and operates a portfolio of 6 million square feet of branded community-focused new age retail destinations in major Indian cities. Anupam was recognized as one of India's leading urban innovators by Metropolis, the World Association of Major Metropolises in Indian Cities Managing Urban Growth. 
He has been invited to share his vision of alternative urban futures at SAIS, the John Hopkins University and the World Bank in Washington, DC. And he has co-developed and teaches as guest faculty an executive education course on inclusive city making at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy in Singapore. Welcome, Anupam. Philip, Philip Slade. Philip is a strategic planner, curious about the world. He has held senior roles in network agencies and co-founded three startups. Philip has a talent for launching innovative, collaborative working practices to propel business forward by using better insights and distinctive killer creative briefs. An energetic people person with recognition for expanding marketing communications into new and exciting channels, combining an avid technology interest with creative thinking to maximize data insights. Philip has most recently been working on a place branding project in Dubai, following successful city branding projects in the UK, particularly in the Northern Industrial Revolution cities of Sheffield and Hull. In the past, he has led branding projects for brands such as Bentley, Diageo, Mini, and UBS. Originally an art director at Saatchi and Saatchi, uh, where he was involved in advertising British Airways, before later in life retraining as a planner. Philip is an honorary vice president of the Marketing Agencies Association and a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. Philip tells us that he also performed in the London 2012 Olympic opening ceremony but as he says, that's another story. Welcome, Philip. Hello. Anupam, may I hand over to you? Thank you so much. Uh, real pleasure to be here. Um, let me quickly share my presentation. Well, lovely to be here, as I said. Thank you, uh, Vinita, for inviting me. I thought it might be appropriate to perhaps frame this presentation in four parts. Um, a little bit about myself, um, perhaps elucidating bit on some of those experiences that were referred to in the introduction. Um, moving on to sharing a framework for place branding that I have developed over the years and believe it endures, uh, particularly now when we live in a post-pandemic world with very little travel um, and who knows for how long. Um, I segue into 10 principles I believe are important when we're thinking of branding places. And then I want to share some stories about two destinations which I think have done it quite successfully. There are many, but I think uh, these two stand out. So with that, jumping straight into a little bit of background. So I began my career nearly 20 years ago, and I always like to begin, I suppose, in my cultural tradition, it's always nice to pay homage to your teacher. And I was very privileged to work with a gentleman called Shunu Sen, who co-founded uh, at the end of his career, very successful career as marketing director of Levers. He co-founded a company called Quadra Advisory, which was part of WPP, uh, which he co-founded with Martin Sorrow. And Shunu unfortunately passed on, but I had the privilege of serving as his executive assistant in my first job and worked very closely with him in, in a variety of assignments. Um, and he also co-authored many articles, and I had the unique privilege of co-authoring his last published article, which was on Marketing's Tomorrow. And I really cherish that because in many ways, he introduced me to the ideas which have shaped subsequent uh, assignments that I've worked on. Um, I think the most notable of them was India. Rarely do you get an opportunity to work on uh, a brand like India. Uh, India is, of course, uh, well known for its civilizational culture, but it's a young country. It's a young political idea, only 70 plus years old. And when this opportunity came uh, along, uh, largely uh, due to Shunu, who was an originally approached and um, I jumped on the opportunity to work on Brand India, uh, helped create an organization called the India Brand Equity Foundation. And that I think was quite pivotal in understanding uh, not just how a brand manifests, but how do you actually manage a brand on an ongoing basis, particularly as complex as a country or a city. Um, this billboard is actually, I think it's Zurich Airport. And as you can see, that's all it says. And that particular year in 2006, when we decided to take over Davos in a guerrilla campaign called India Everywhere, uh, all we did was really position India, I think quite cleverly, 
vis-a-vis um, -vis China, which was the main, arguably the main competitor that India had when it came to foreign investment dollars. And our main mission to uh, brand India was to increase foreign investment. Um, I want to talk a few about a few other stories that I had an opportunity to work on. Um, the Volvo Ocean Race is the world, world's longest yacht race. I had the opportunity to work on this fantabulous event and bring it to Asia for the first time in its history. Uh, it put a city called Kochi in the south of India on the map. Uh, I thought this was a phenomenal project and not many cities think about opportunities that they can grab uh, because uh, of mega events and such hosting opportunities. And I think mega events do play an important role in, in brand transformation. Uh, a stopover of the Volvo Ocean Race is quite a remarkable experiential opportunity and a transformation opportunity for the host city. And uh, this is not Kochi, I think, but it, it's just giving you a glimpse of what a stopover looks like. Um, along the way, I had an opportunity to work on London, um, which was uh, quite unique. And uh, since my fellow panelist was at London 2012, I probably was there somewhere in the crowd. Um, it was... It was great to actually work on the handover moment four years prior uh, when, when London got the handover from Beijing. And uh, the mayor at that time, Ken Livingston, uh, and then Boris Johnson, uh, their teams were absolutely spectacular. And I think gave me a real insight on a, how a brand like London can actually uh, remain dynamic. Uh, I think my when I was first approached for this assignment, I... I, I was quite flummoxed because I said, do you really need to brand London? And, and I think that in itself was uh, the real insight that you do need to brand places and keep them alive and keep them fresh. And obviously with a mega event like the Olympics, I, I think London needed to be contemporized and its leadership recognized that. And I think was very visionary in claiming space despite being a global brand leader uh, in a new way, in an imaginative way. and and pushed forward with its image, which I think continues to have a very strong reputation despite everything that's going on in the world. I think London very clearly remains as one of the top, if not the top global city brand. Uh, from the interesting and uh, very rarefied world of countries and cities, uh, this is the world of uh, retail real estate, which I had the opportunity to work on, virtuous retail. This is really when uh, branding ideas abstractly met reality of placemaking, creating something from the ground up. And I think this was a fabulous uh, opportunity to actually shape uh, completely out of thin air, uh, both a physical place, but also a brand that was rooted in the cultural uh, heritage of cities of India. That was the big idea that we landed on when we created these shopping malls, really. But we were very conscious that we don't want these to behave or be perceived as shopping malls. So the intention was uh, very much at the heart of development design and brand strategy to develop these as places of, of culture, of art, uh, essentially for people. And I think that strategy always succeeds. And I'm pleased to share that this is now the largest institutionally owned retail development company and has a network of these uh, city centers across the country. And particularly now where we are in all kinds of lockdown or limited movement, these are playing important roles in the community by providing other kinds of services for health and so on. So I, I, I'm very happy to have been a part of this. Um, and, and the two destinations that are uh, highlighted here are one in the city of Surat and the other in Bangalore. Uh, if you ever visit either of these cities, do give it a, do give it a chance. All right, a, a short video that I thought will give you, uh, bring to life the VR story. This is from VR Bengaluru. I say is what you 
I think the insight I want to share is that the campaign actually never used the building uh, in any imagery. And the main idea was actually in, in black box on Whitefield Road. And I think that's often what place brands need. They need an idea because places uh, are obviously physical, but they live in people's heads and they need to uh, motivate emotions, uh, hopefully positive ones, but often they also motivate negative emotions. So places do have I think a quality that can be captured in an idea. And I think that's what I really want to spend my time talking about in terms of what is a framework. And I call it, how loud is your echo? And uh, I suppose that's self-explanatory in the sense that uh, echo is something that happens as a, as a leftover quality. And I think if, if, you're, if you're saying something with a high quality and content that is um, appropriate, then you can actually have a very loud echo. These slides are actually several years old, but I keep them in, in, in that it goes to show that uh, it's a crowded marketplace. It's only become even more crowded. And I think the tendency is to create logos and taglines, and I don't dismiss that, but I do think that there is a place for it um, in the larger context of building a place brand, but that is not the only goal that place brands should have. So as you can see, uh, the various places here uh, would probably evoke different images to you based on your own experiences. Uh, it, is, it is quite a crowded marketplace still, and I, I would submit that perceptions really shape place brands, not the places themselves. And uh, place brands in particular are based on perceived truth. Uh, this, these slides were created in a pre-social media world, but I think this has only become um, truer in a sense that decisions are now driven by a set of experiences, what, what is heard, read, and seen, and that is even more amplified through social media now. But I think what is lost is that despite how much you might be saying at whatever investment you have made, unfortunately, your awareness might be limited to name recognition. In most cases, that is the unfortunate truth. And in the absence of sustained, aligned, and coherent marketing, stereotypes really dominate perception. And this is true of places because they're really formed in pop culture. Uh, so what is really needed from a brand strategist, marketing perspective, from a, a organizational perspective is management of both messages and media. Uh, and, and you know it goes through a journey. Uh, some call it a narrative arc, brands travel, uh, time uh, over many different situations that they can't control. So you really, the only thing you can control is the stories. And in some senses, you know, you have to go through this. There's no shortcut. You have to go through the space of building, you know, opinion about yourself. And then hopefully, um, depending on your objective, whether it's tourism or investment, you actually start providing experiences. And that only happens through time. Uh, but I think the base foundation comes from information, a, a good place where you can collect stories, provide information to engage with individuals, companies, and um, organizations. So I, I think this might be obvious, but I thought it's good to pull this out and say, why, do we, why should we build brands? Why should we build place brands? Um, and I think it's important to recognize that it adds economic value. I haven't even gone into the point of social and cultural value potentially, but I think it, it, this is sufficient um, evidence that place branding results in investment in economic activity, but also adds to quality of life. So I think there is a, a lot of merit in place branding. Um, but again, it's not just about logos and taglines, and it's definitely a more complicated science. Um, and I think this is Michael Porter, I think, who said this. Uh, it's about competitive strategy. It's about de deliberate choice 
on a different set of activities. Uh, it's not about doing more of the same. So if you're copying things that others have done, I think imitation leads to limited long-term success. I mean, you might succeed in the short term because you have a lot of resource to throw at it, but usually that doesn't uh, result in an enduring strategy. And one of my case studies is gonna reflect a bit on that. Um, and finally, I, I submit that the power of networks is very important in brand building. So what I call echo networks that you can develop over time uh, through experience design and perception management, but eventually it begins with a positioning strategy. So whether it's the idea for Brand India, where we chose fastest growing free market democracy as a positioning idea, um, or others that have over the years, uh, I will share one or two. I think competitive positioning is actually at the heart of success. Um, this is what I spoke about earlier. This was in, in many ways our organizing idea. It was not meant to be a communication idea, but it eventually found its way into communication. And this is the result, the proof point, that arguably this was one of the key reasons where India saw a surge in uh, foreign investment. Um, and it's, it's not a trivial surge. And I think even till date, at least last I checked in 2018 or 19, the growth, despite the overall volume continuing to grow, obviously, the growth that India saw during that time period uh, has still not been uh, exceeded. And I think that's largely because we did manage to achieve a very coherent approach. It was a public-private partnership. Uh, we managed to actually get, which is quite hard to do in the Indian context, a lot of stakeholders behind the strategy. And there was an organization, a small one, that was uh, conceived with, with this intent and mandate. So I think that, that helped a lot. So I'll, I'll end this section and, and really sum it up in 10 principles. Uh, I think it's very important for place bands to think horizontally. Uh, they always have multiple objectives going on, whether it's investment, tourism, uh, PR. It is also political, but I think that's where sometimes opportunity is lost. So you do need a coalition. You need, ideally, in my view, at least business uh, leadership, coordination, typically from government, uh, and community-owned. We often forget that brands are eventually about people, particularly place brands. So citizens and, and uh, local communities need to participate in, in place branding. Uh, I argue that you need a 30-year vision, but a three-year implementation horizon. Uh, and probably even in COVID days, probably a shorter time horizon for implementation. You need to look at digital transformation. I, I think the fourth point is a very, very important. You need to be constantly course correcting. So reconciling, renewing, and relaunching almost as a regular discipline. Uh, Human capital is key, goes without saying. Uh, eventually, these are, whether it's sitting within agencies or clients or whatever framework of operation, you do need structure to support brand activity of this nature. Um, it's not just about capital. It's important to balance fun with capital. It's, it's not just about the numbers. Um, I, I argue particularly for place brands, uh, referring to things like virtuous retail, you need a master developer, master developer approach at a city level particularly when you're reinventing your city brand, for example. Um, brands and buildings, again, taking cue from virtuous retail, that uh, buildings are building. You have to come up with ideas to shape personality and, and then give them context. Um, heritage can be an important economic driver, and mega events are important catalysts, as you saw in the case of Kochi. So I, I thought I'll just very briefly talk about two examples. One is... Uh, the little red dot, Singapore. And I think it, it represents this growth mindset exceptionally well. Uh, Singapore is a resource constrained, uh, like you wouldn't believe it. I mean, it's small, it's, it, you know, it's got issues around water, it, it, so many different things, but it has overcome all of them uh, by doing this. It had a, it, you know, it had an entrepreneurial approach. Um, in fact, the very origin of this term, red dot came from uh, one of the political adversaries of Singapore sort of almost demeaning it by calling it, oh, look at that little red dot on the map. And I think uh, Singapore embraced that in many ways. It, it, this is actually from The Economist when it did a special report on Singapore. And I think that goes to show that it's been very clever in the way it has approached branding. Um, actually, it has also managed how other people have positioned it, which is very critical because what we realize in the absence of uh, you not managing your brand, somebody else will brand you. And that is the harsh truth about place branding. Uh, Singapore does 
exceptional product development at a city level. So it has an enormous amount of investment and planning that goes into shaping the product and the experience. Uh, the Singapore River Festival is just one example of that. These are just some visuals showing the, the skyline and the nightlife and the vibrant place that it now is and continues to reinvent itself. Uh, these are just some of the place brands that Singapore has created. Uh, really, if you get into the detail, they are um, eventually stories which have been told really well, both physically and then through communication. Uh, this is uh, the picture that I have at my background as well. This is the wonderful Gardens by the Bay, in my mind, uh, iconic project, but has really shown also the imagination at play here of the vision of a city in a garden not just a garden city. And, and that is really a, an idea that Singapore picked up um, and continues to reinvent what a garden, a city in garden looks like and feels like. Uh, the second story I want to talk about is, is, is Dubai, which I think has also been very deliberate, uh, has made some missteps over the last two decades, particularly around the global financial crisis, and I think has found its way again. And of course, we all know that this event is uh, no longer happening in the way it was originally conceived for reasons beyond their control. And I think this is where I would, I would say that Dubai has still some way to go. I, I think often it's compared with Singapore, but I do think that there are uh, some strategic differences when it comes to planning and identity. And, and Dubai has certainly, I think, started down that road. This is an example of a project which I like very much. It's an old marble factory, I think, uh, owned by a, a wealthy family and a philanthropic investment has turned it into a cultural district. And it's, it's, a, it's a very fabulous, vibrant place built with a lot of care. Uh, this is actually an art gallery. It's become a performance venue. Uh, and it's, it's a wonderful place and, and very unlike the mega malls of Dubai. And I think this is the sort of fabric that Dubai needs to consider at a more granular level. And I think it's starting to build more in line with its own conditions, um, which I think is appropriate because you do need, you can, as I said earlier, imitation it will only take you that far. So I think Dubai is really starting to get it and I think uh, will be certainly a city brand to watch for. I will end with this um, slide about uh, one of my favorite urban regeneration projects and a brand that I think is, is really now solidly on the map, Seoul in Korea. And I think the future of situation and place branding comes down to three things. Uh, it's competitive positioning. It is foresight more so now than ever. But ultimately, it's about experience design. Um, and I say, you know, it's beyond logos and campaigns or before logos and campaigns. I think that forms a very small part of communication and should not be uh, misunderstood for brand strategy for places. So uh, with that, you know, I want to thank you for the opportunity and look forward to the discussion ahead. Anupan, thank you very much. That was absolutely fascinating. And I think particularly interesting that um, you talked about Dubai, because I think, as I said in Philip's bio, he's also only had some recent experience with Dubai. So perhaps we can have that as part of the conversation. I think it would be fascinating. Um, but let's, let's hear from Philip. Philip, thank you very, well, as I say, Anupan, thank you very much. Really fascinating. Um, Philip, over to you. Yes. Um... There's a lot I could talk about Dubai. Uh, a lot of it's under NDA at the moment because, as has just been pointed out, their future of some of their events are currently in discussion as to when they will happen. Okay, well, if we, I mean, obviously, we don't want to compromise your um, <laughs> relationship with uh, Dubai, but if we can touch on that later, that would be interesting. Yeah. But, but let me hand over to you. I'm, I'm Philip. I'm... Um, an advertiser, uh, advertising strategist who in recent years ha I've been um, director of strategy at an agency called J-Wing who have quite a specialism in place branding and I thought I'd take you through three examples of recent projects we've done and our very humanist approach to place branding. The first is Sheffield. Uh, Sheffield, if you don't know it, is a northern English city. It was built on steel and it's reflective of the whole life cycle of heavy industry in the UK. That is from boom and prosperity beginning in, in the Industrial Revolution to bust and dereliction in the 1980s. It's weathered wars, strikes and extreme civil unrest along the way. In fact, 
way back in time, George Orwell called it the ugliest town in the old world. Sheffield is now a centre of a diverse collection of manufacturing from high tech to a very strong independent art scene focused in music and performance art. It is also a, center, a major centre of international education um, and with a, a very strong centre of political debate. Now, previous attempts at branding this city and trying to create a point of difference for it on the world stage, particularly uh, to attract inward investment, has failed because of the various stakeholders, competing allegiances, and all manner of um, uh, issues that happen when the key character of a city is its independence. Um, but with Brexit, uh, local devolution and uh, national debates about infrastructure, it was important that the city gained a cohesive new um, strategy and that's where we came in. We were tasked with creating a new strategy. Now our approach is to deep dive lots of research and we tend to present our findings from many weeks of insight in these types of grids where we try and narrow a city's DNA down into uh, six key parts. And this would normally lead us to an understanding about a visual and tonal approach. But Sheffield was kind of different because what we found as we looked at the fabric and the narrative and what the geography, what the people, what the archetype was like, one of our team actually wrote a poem rather than creating a visual mood board or something like this, they wrote a poem and we all thought, well, that's it, that's the answer. So I thought I'll read you that poem now. I deal in real, I make, I craft, I create, I collaborate, I educate, I play, I perform, I bring things to life. I approach all this with open arms, with energy, with soul. I am warm and engaging, yet direct and bold, always with an opinion just maybe not the one you're expecting, but I will never let you down. For all the things I am, I am me, I am Sheffield, and I'm all right. You have to do that last bit in a strong Sheffield accent, by the way. Um, but what we found, what this poem did for us, and we shared it with our, our client teams very early on, was that it had a central truth, and as has just been said, until you find the central truth, the purity of what makes a place a place, you can't really progress. And what we found was Sheffield makes people and people make Sheffield. And this was, be, this was going to take us into a, a very different type of uh, branding because it wasn't about a brand with guidelines and rules. It was a brand that was going to be a curator, an editor and a storyteller of people. So it was gonna be a brand made four people and we made the brand from this launched about 18 months ago uh, open source so anyone can download guidelines grids systems fonts and things and make it their own and what it meant was for a cash strapped local council and a multitude of different stakeholders they were able to take the dna and elements of an identity but apply it in their own way so it was in theme to the city but it wasn't dictatorial. And I'll show you a, a short film that kind of brings this to life. And we were very lucky late last year to get finalist status in the City Nation Place Awards, one of the only UK cities to do so as both place brand of the year and best use of design. I'm now going to talk about rebranding Edinburgh's Hogmanay, which, if you don't know it, is 
one of the world's great street parties, but actually it began uh, decades ago as an informal street gathering. Um, and this informal street gathering, when the pub shut, people came out to celebrate New Year's Eve, celebrate Hogmanay, it, to use its Scottish title, this grew and grew until by the early 1990s, 300,000 people would take to the streets in a completely unorganized party into the early hours of the morning. And the authorities decided they needed to try and organize it and create some form of order. So they began to turn this into a branded four day ticketed event. And soon it became the biggest New Year's Eve party in the world with 57% of attendees coming from outside Scotland. Impact studies in 2004 and 2010 highlighted the huge economic benefit of, these, of this event. But these impact studies also highlighted a disconnect the event was beginning to have from its location and culture because it, it had become an international music event with with not much connection to where it's actually being held. So our rather tricky brief was to maintain the economic benefit, but address the subjects of local culture and belonging, subjects very much in the public eye in Scotland after a very closely fought independence referendum and a resurgence in a belief and understanding of Scotland in its own entity. The other, slight issue was of all the bidding agencies we were the only non-Scottish agency bidding for this work. Now I'm going to show you another video. Um, a version of this we actually used to pitch for the business which we successfully won and the script from this pretty much as you hear it here is now read out in the moments leading up to New Year's Eve and the start of the new year each year now for the last few years. Welcome. Step across our threshold and join our rebellion against the darkness of winter. Because this is not the end of a year, but the beginning of a new. And we will shake the whole of Scotland as we gather to ring it in and run the 12 months length again. We will not settle. We will be seen. We will be heard. We will sleep when we are dead. We will clasp the hands of every stranger because this belongs to all of us. This is our new year. This is the new year. We'll leave as beacons, shining lights that say to the world, I was there. Edinburgh's Hogmanay. It'll leave its mark. It will leave its mark. This was the truth. This was bigger than any international touring band or chocolate box image of Scotland or um, TV personality. What this was, was the emotional benefit above any rational feature. This was the elevation of the event into a bucket list event intrinsically linked to the new Scotland and very much linked to what made Edinburgh unique. Now, this was launched at New Year's Eve 2018. It's uh, now entering its third and fourth year, um, if it happens this year, obviously still very much up in the air. Um, but what has happened over the last few years as it's been implemented and refined and refined is many different agencies, stakeholders and partners have implemented elements of this uh, look and feel and the tonality of it, but it's always been unified, not by a strict set of uh, brand police, but by a belief in what it does for Edinburgh. This, it, it generates the understanding, this is gonna be a life affirming experience. It's gonna leave a mark on everyone who comes. Now, since oh, <laughs> I'm sorry, oh, but I'm... sorry, uh, right, sorry. Um, so, since the rebrand, the event has uh, has been delivered with 38 percent less public funding 
due to an increase in outside investment, which has meant a two million pound sterling saving to Edinburgh Council. There's also been increases in the number of visitors, both local and international, and an overall 95% satisfaction score of good or very good. 71% of outside visitors said Hogmanay was the main or only reason for visiting Edinburgh. And one of the reasons given for the success in being able to keep this momentum going has been the simplicity of the central point. And as, it, as this quote said, it's this essence of what Edinburgh delivers. And that's what we think we managed to capture with that. Right, the final one, Hull. If you don't know Hull, it has a, an un unusual history. It's a major town on the northeast coast of England. It was once the thriving centre of industrialised fishing. Now, it has the largest working class population in the UK, with some of the country's highest levels of deprivation. In 2010, it was voted the worst place to live in the UK and featured prominently in this rather charming coffee table book. But only a few years later, it was awarded the chance to launch the UK's City of Culture. And it did this with a bid around the theme of coming out of the shadows. Now we were appointed shortly after this, and we were given just two years to prepare for January the 1st, 2017, and launch Hull's Year as the UK's City of Culture. Now we spent a huge amount of time speaking with various stakeholders and groups of locals, from school children, to old age pensioners, to refugees, to everybody who found themselves in this town. And we knew after doing this, that this was gonna be more than a brand identity. This, this was about a battered and bruised community stepping into the national spotlight. And it was doing so quite fearful of a media that was already calling into question the appropriateness of celebrating culture in such a place as Hull. So I'm gonna show you a short film that sums up what happened. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I've never heard of Hull till I come up here. It's crap. It's a shithole. A fish pond at the end of the railway. Oh, oh. Drink, obesity, we're always in the bottom six, and it's true. The UK City of Culture Thank <laughs> you. This was loud, it was proud, and it was totally unabashed exercise in civic pride. This wasn't an event logo. This was about taking a city forgotten by the rest of the UK and putting it squarely in their consciousness. 
we created a visual and, and tonal language, which again had to be enthusiastically interpreted and applied by numerous stakeholders, agencies and other bodies. But it was, and it was successfully used because people believed in what it was doing and the fact that it wasn't outsiders coming in to tell a city what to do, although we were from the outside, um, it felt like the city doing this. And indeed, we were very much guided all the way through by our friends and uh, colleagues who we'd made during those research uh, phases. Following the event, impact studies highlighted the very tangible economic benefits of the event. The, we've just seen on that film, you know, 350 in the end million in tourist revenue, six million extra visitors, most of whom had never been to Hull before, 22 million gross uh, sterling in value added to the local economy during that first year, and I'll come on to what happened in following years, 75% of visitors from outside the area said they'd changed their opinion about Hull for the better. A study last year in 2019 showed that the City of Culture programme was directly responsible for at least 89 million pounds of investment into the city and contributed to more than 32 million being fundraised. Now, it, as one of the UK's most deprived areas prior this event, this is, these are incredible figures and it's double what Hull had originally hoped for. Now, this led to many awards and accolades, which is great. However, it's the human benefit that lasts and I feel is most valuable. Ten years ago, when Hull featured in a humorous book of crap towns, a local newspaper found that most locals actually agreed with this sentiment. Yet, 12 months after the year of culture had finished, Three out of four people now said they were proud to live in Hull, illustrated no small part by the large number of locals who now sport our event branding as permanent tattoos on their bodies. We also find the volunteering programme that began in 2017 still runs to this day, and it runs because of the, the huge enthusiasm generated by the people who took part, who now want to keep being a part of the city. And this is also showing up in participation in the arts and local sports. So hopefully you've seen with these three um, case studies, we, we have six key values about how we go about branding a place or a location and how we, how we embrace, how, to, um, how we, sorry, generate greater economic impact with the work we do and it starts with the values both past and present events global events of we're currently passing through show us the importance of being very true to the values of a place and understanding it's good and bad and the people you must start and understand the culture within a local personality its traits the whole thing with Sheffield was imposing a logo imposing Branding was the last thing these people wanted. They wanted to be the branding themselves. And finding the joy, the design industry has a bit of a bad reputation of being quite joyless and quite serious at times. And so much of location and place branding is about the joy of a place, enjoying the, the passage of being somewhere. And truth, finding that single truth because every problem has a centre, and until you find what the centre of the problem is, the work will always suffer. And it, it's the unspoken human truth that sheds light on the answer. And this will be the insight that will drive a greater economic benefit. As has already, be, already been said, slogans and logos have their place, but we never start with this. And in fact, in some cases, like Sheffield's a good example, it's a minor, minor if if there at all. What matters is the structure and belief that goes behind it, and that's what you have to start with. And finally, ownership. Ownership of unique assets. You, you should be able to take the names and logos off the work and still know where you are, because that's what makes it unique. 
I should also mention about a vibrancy of legacy, but actually, if you've got those previous steps right and you've done due diligence, the legacy will come. Hull, we had a separate project that started afterwards to capture and build on the legacy. In the end, we were pretty much stood down from that project because the legacy had already generated such momentum and energy within the local population. It was driving itself. So finally, um, hopefully you've seen how we work and how we generate economic benefit with branding and that branding can be a driver beyond uh, structural effects because it's, it's emotional and it transcends uh, the rational. And we always try and bring it down into a single thing because for Sheffield, it was about focus, focusing an independent city around one idea of the power of its people. For Edinburgh, it was creating that, selling a lasting effect way beyond whatever was part of that year's event. And Hull, Hull was about a rediscovery of pride. And it's now, all three have been proven with strong, profitable outcomes for the local bodies. Right, that's me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Philip. Uh, and thank you very much, Anupam. Both absolutely fascinating um, uh, uh, learnings, I think. I, I, um, there are so many questions I'd like to ask, but I think I'm going to start from the, the starting point of brands. When and, and it was fascinating to see that you see in Hull's case, people stamp the Hull mark on their skin, because of course we know that brands really originated as a way to, de to determine a sense of ownership of branding an animal. Um, so this notion of a sense of belonging uh, and being part of something, but they're also about differentiation. And, and I think it's really fascinating to kind of think about, you know, what is, what is the single idea that helps people make choices? Why I choose, you know, Edinburgh, why I choose Hull, why I choose um, Dubai. It, we know that brands are a kind of mental shorthand. So a question for you, Anupam, what do you think Dubai's idea is and what do you think Singapore's idea is? Is there a driving idea that is something that can endure and that can adapt and that can bring emotional and rational benefits? Uh, so I suppose, yes, um, there is. Obviously, it depends entirely on the objective and who's driving that notion. Um, I think Singapore, to some extent, has transcended that. Uh, it, it has come to be known for pushing the envelope uh, when it comes to the future. So I think it's organizing ideas, the future. Mm -hmm. The future is here, it's now. Uh, it continues to, um, it, it's institutionalized foresight at multiple levels, whether educational, in the bureaucracy, at, at government. So it's, it's institutionalized at the very citizen level where future thinking is not odd. If you go and ask someone, literally man or woman on the street, they probably have a point of view on that. So that's pretty remarkable. So I think for Singapore, uh, it hasn't really been about heritage or past because it's such a young place and it is really driven by creating the future in, in pretty much in one or two or three generations, which are now reaping the benefits of what they saw. So I think that's really Singapore's organizing idea. Dubai is, is, is a bit trickier. I think it wants to own the future, um, but I'm not so sure whether it is going to succeed in that, partly because I think it has a very rich past in a sense. Um, and I think it needs to really look at managing the present a lot more at this point. Um, I struggle to find an organizing idea uh, in Dubai. I, I think that's partly because it has looked outside a lot. And I think it's probably a good time to introspect and really create an organizing idea from within, find something special within. And I, I, I having been to Dubai many times, I'm, I'm truly impressed by the physical development, by the way. So uh, by no means do I have any disrespect for the city. I think it's actually done a marvelous job in a short span of time of creating the kind of a physical transformation that we've seen and really push the boundaries of imagination as well when you look at all the superstructures that they've built up. But eventually places are about people, I think that's been said many times. And I'm curious about how people, whether it's own 
for the people who visit and live and stay for a few years or make it a their, their home. I'm curious about what their view is. And I don't think that there is a coherent view yet. So I think Dubai needs to um, invest in some soul searching. Interesting. Philip, would you have any comments on this that you're able to share with us? Given I, I totally agree. Um, before lockdown, uh, Dubai was coming to terms with the fact that global trends in long haul travel, but both uh, leisure and business were changing. And Dubai had been very successful in a previous world, but actually its major tourist market, certainly the top five uh, inbound tourist markets, their trends for what people were looking for, for breaks, were changing. And Expo was part of Dubai's answer to looking at how it might change. And certainly the uh, change from car culture to pedestrian culture in some of the newer developments in Dubai were, were an example of that. Now, how you market that, and that was our job, we were not looking at building things, we were looking at marketing things that, um, absolutely agree, a bold move, which Dubai is not afraid of making bold moves, was what was necessary. Uh, now everything's on hold for the moment, but uh, it is true. Dubai cannot move forward as it was. And you can see with what they were trying to do with the expo is those physical bold moves and their marketing needs to be in parallel to that. It can't market itself like a long haul destination like it used to. Um, it needs a exactly as you say, a look in its soul as to what it actually is. And it does have some incredible advantages over its competitors. In fact, in some ways, it is still quite a unique place on earth. Would it be fair to say it's a relatively new place as well? And in, in, in a sense, Anupam, I think you were saying something similar about Singapore. These are relatively, and indeed even India in some contexts, I know it these are in relatively new places and how long does it take for a place to really d define or ex discover its soul let's say uh, 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 is, is that a fair question to ask do you think I mean in terms I, of I, I think so I think it's an absolutely fair question to ask and I think it's it's really a question that and in a dialogue and uh, investigation interrogation that the places leaders and citizens need to engage in uh, quite honestly and transparently and through participatory processes and uh, conversation. And it requires both leaders and followers and, and those roles could change from time to time. But I think um, when it comes to Singapore, it had some very strong leaders, notably uh, its founding Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew, but there were many, many uh, strong leaders, uh, teams that were built up, institutions that were developed. And uh, I think the key differentiating point when it comes to Singapore was that uh, its leaders were very clear that they want to build up the people of Singapore, not just Singapore as a place. Mm -hmm. And so the intention was not just to raise per capita income, but to raise individual income. Mm -hmm. uh, that has made all the difference. So you have close to 90% of society living in public housing and the Housing Development Board and the Urban Redevelopment Authority, these are really marvelous agencies which are quite unique in the world today when you think about you know public agencies delivering value at, at a phenomenal scale and so i think that's the major difference when i think of india or dubai or many other places that i think this is often forgotten when we're framing policy is that eventually this is about people so how do you find ways and this is not something that we have found solutions to it's something we grapple with everywhere uh, but certainly i think you can when you think of a place like dubai i think you can discover some phenomenal routes into the future i think uh, philip's already made the point that arguably travel was not a sustainable idea to build a future on um, and you need to also think of more permanent enduring uh, organizing ideas such as Dubai's location, which if you take away the notion of global travel, it's still a very unique uh, location in the region. Yep. It's also a very unique society in, in that the choices it has made about how it wants to move into the future. And I think there's a very big opportunity for it to define and shape a narrative 
uh, keeping its its people in mind and and involving its people, and I think that could reveal some interesting answers. And Dubai has some fabulous stories to 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 tell from its past, but I think it's 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 yet to write its best ones. So I, I'm looking forward to what it might actually do in the post pandemic world. I think that's fascinating too, because I think what we learned from Philip's stories about Hull, particularly the sense of pride, but equally people in Sheffield, if, if people have a strong feeling for their place, in a way that's the uni unifying thing and the, the kind of lack of coherence from a traditional branding perspective, as in things looking neat and tidy and consistent, in a sense doesn't matter. Um, but uh, I'm particularly interested in how uh, you can sustain that spirit that people feel uh, from a, a year like Hull. I mean, and Philip, maybe some thoughts from you on this one. People have continued to volunteer. How do you sustain that? And, and what role do can city planners and administrators play in tapping into that and perhaps marrying you know the the human spirit at an individual level with their you know with their resources and organizational expertise what is there a, a kind of magic a, a secret source there um in a way yes it's about the local civic authorities understanding the power of what they've got which is once you open the floodgates to large-scale volunteering like that the same happened in london actually after the olympics you had to be able to provide, the, the civic authorities had to provide the mechanisms for large scale volunteering to continue, which is what Hull did. And as I said, they, the legacy programme has sort of shifted slightly subsequently, um, and it has become a place of great pride. Uh, the inward investment, which came, uh, not intentionally, but came, uh, it was hopefully would happen, help that. But it is, um, it is top down to sustain these sort of legacy programs. There are countless examples of big events from Olympics onwards where the legacy didn't work. Mm -hmm. And this is normally because of a lack of faith and a lack of long-term belief. Normally because local politicians are in and out of office every three or four years. And there's a lack of belief in wanting to support the programs of your predecessors. I mean, that's sadly human nature, but uh, it is true. The cities that have done well for fo following a big event have belief. I do think the Singapore example is really good because you make the point earlier about large scale events and the use of events like the Formula One night race in Singapore has been a really good way of telling a different story about Singapore to a different audience on a global stage where you don't need to reinforce certain values because you're associated with a certain type of sport, those values are already with you. Yeah, fascinating. That's a really good example. Um, it, and it's, Singapore has used events to its advantage, but I think it's been very careful in its choice of events. And even its choice of Formula One has been, uh, as you know, it's a street race. Yes. And it's a night race, so it is distinctive even within the yes. fancier Formula One races. So I think it, it very much was about the future as well and continues to be. And in fact, Singapore actually has claimed that it doesn't necessarily want to be hosting many mega events. In fact, I remember the time when I had engaged with them for the Volvo Ocean Race and they declined because they realized that this is not something that perhaps fits with their vision. So I think that that is absolutely true, and I think the Hull story is remarkable, but I think it originates in the vision of its leaders and a clear strategy and positioning idea that, look, this is who we are, this is where we want to go. Obviously, you remain flexible, but I think that is very important, and you can't that can't be a flimsy foundation. So I think the choice of culture as an idea for Hull is remarkable, and what a wonderful transformation. A very good point there about choice of events and less is more. Dubai, I'm sure won't mind. It's an obvious point, but they go for absolutely everything. They've got so many events and so many, so much investment has gone into trying to do everything. Because of that, there's nothing. And I think one of the reasons why I think they went so enthusiastically after the expo 
was an ability to maybe drop some of the other events and focus on uh, humanity for the future and a look at what the future of human development in a new type of city could be. And the ideas behind marketing expo to overseas visitors was very much about that changing uh, opinion about Dubai. Because I think in the past, just having tennis and golf and cycling and everything they could lay their hands on was not really working. I, I think it was a lot of consultants had a field day with Dubai, but I think in reality, uh, when, you, when you look at an example like Al Sarkal Avenue, which I shared, which has been built up over time, it didn't just happen overnight, it required a lot of care and thought and investment, philanthropic, uh, from a family that transformed its marble factory into this wonderful art and cultural district. There is another project in Dubai called the Design District, and I think that's also shaping up quite well. I haven't visited uh, for, for a couple of years now, but I think the, the idea of uh, Dubai as a global city, I think, befuddles me a bit, and I think Dubai really needs to reinvent itself and reach for something more authentic. Um, yeah. And as abstract as it may sound, maybe it's peace. Uh, given that we live in such a world of conflict and where the whole notion of peace is being, uh, I think, explored and rightly so, I think it's almost like, uh, it's not just peace is not the absence of war. It's, you know, it's actually escalation of peace in itself is a, is a mission. And wouldn't that be a noble goal, uh, particularly for that region? Uh, and, and Dubai can be a leader in that, you know, to facilitate dialogue, interfaith um, projects, I think those are the kinds of really bold ideas that a city like Dubai can lead. And it has some great leadership, um, irrespective of whatever the notions of governance and development models are. I do think that strong leadership, capable leadership, which it does have, um, can do wonders if it really sets its goal on the right target. That's a fascinating proposition, Anupam. That would be an amazing thing to, to convince the leaders of Dubai to embrace, I think, as an idea. But I'm going to turn, finally, I know we've been talking for just over an hour, it's been fascinating, to ask you both what you think we, I say we, particularly city planners and administrators, can learn from the, 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 the situation we're in now. The coronavirus has obviously been hugely damaging and still is at, at every level, economically, socially, politically. And, and cities are places where people congregate, where humanity is fundamentally closely together and, and we're being challenged by this virus in a sense. I'd be very interested to know what you think uh, are, are going to be some of the opportunities and challenges uh, cities face, both from a leadership perspective, an administrative perspective, but also us as citizens, you know, what, because as citizens, we behave both individually and collectively, and, and, in, and what opportunity do we have to shape the experience of the cities and the places we live in? I mean, it's quite a big question to ask with a lot of strands, but, and either of you can kick off. Um, I guess a personal um, uh, campaign of mine is one about making cities walkable, and it, it's already been mentioned about how the current uh, crisis has led to a re-evaluation about how you pedestrianise larger areas. Um, certainly a number of major global cities have temporarily pedestrianised, yeah. increased bike lanes. Even America is considering bike lanes <laughs> in their major cities, which is a major change. Um, that has to be a good thing. Um, and can't just be a temporary response to um, a disease because actually making cities more livable by making them more outdoors and making, uh, we can't rebuild a city tomorrow. Therefore we have to live with the accommodation we've got, which is clearly not appropriate. Most cities around the world do not have appropriate accommodation for the modern world, but they can have appropriate outdoor space. And outdoor space, I think, is a prime differentiator that certainly for the next few years will drive people's choices about which cities they visit out of pleasure. Because if you have a choice of visiting city A or city B, 
the city with the largest amount of outdoor space immediately available is going to be the one you go for. You're going to feel more safe. So yes, I do think outdoor space and the management of outdoor space, both private and public, uh, is going to be key. Thank you. Anupam. Uh, so two major points for, from me. I, I would hope that uh, this acts as a catalyst for planners, policymakers, that audience that you referred to, in, in really reflecting on whether we have been developing, envisioning reactionary cities or responsive cities, as I call them. And I think it's very important to develop this as a paradigm, actually, of building responsive, intentional cities that serve the many and not the few. Uh, we often forget that cities are not enclaves, a collection of enclaves for the few. Uh, we are seeing increasing inequality, inequity, and that's actually designed into the city. When we don't have a walkable city, that is an intention. Uh, and that's, that's an intention that lasts decades, if not centuries. In the case of London, it made some good intentional choices, which is why it's an eminently walkable city, unlike many American cities, which we know suffer from all kinds of problems um, which actually result in physically unhealthy people and communities. So these are big, big decisions. So I think that's the, the big, I think, way to frame the way we move forward is to build responsive and intentional places and really curate our public life because we have to reimagine our public life. And I love what Philip said about outdoor spaces and these spaces do need to be intentionally and granularly designed so that people can still go out in large numbers uh, and enjoy the outdoors and enjoy urban life, which is why we have, you know, come to like cities so much and more than half of humanity now resides in them. And then I think leading from that is the second piece, which, which has been obvious, but I suppose the pandemic has really put a spotlight on it, is our mental and social health. And I think that, to me, is an absolutely critical dimension to explore. There is a lot of research that has been going on in it. I'm personally involved in developing what I call a Conscious Cities Index, which seeks to actually uh, measure the impact of the built environment on mental health and argues for intentional design changes in public places to enable people to better manage their mental health. And we know there is enough evidence of nature having a positive impact on our, on our overall health. Um, and so that, to me, is the second very important thing, that let's not give well-being lip service. I know for ever since the Second World War, I think we've come to acknowledge and use and G, you know, use GDP as a, as a measure of success. And, and I think this goes at the heart of competition, that we really need to reshape the dialogue on competition as well and put well-being at the heart of it. We, wouldn't it be great to be competing on well-being? Yeah. Now that real progress for humanity. And I think to me, the best competition between cities is not a reductive one of dollars and tourists or, or talent or capital, which is certainly going to be an important uh, part of it because yes, resource is scarce, but really we need to rise above that and think about overall well-being. So that would be my main message for uh, our leaders and cities. Thank you, Anupam. I think that's a very inspiring place to finish. <laughs> um, Philip, would you like to add anything else? No, I, 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 I completely, completely agree. Completely agree. Yeah. Uh, Anupam, any other thoughts other than to say to both of you, thank you very much. It's been a really inspiring conversation, um, and um, and I think it, it gives one hope. I think at a time when it's quite easy to feel quite. Um, well, challenged by the environment that we live in, uh, and the challenges are, 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 are serious. I mean, absolutely serious. And you might, I think, to focus on people's mental well-being is a really important place to finish when you think of the potential for the, the economic challenges people are facing as a consequence of this. Um, um, so thank you both very much indeed. Thank you so much for ha having me, and I, I really enjoyed the discussion. And on that note, if, if there is interest within your audience, please do encourage them to visit inclusivecitymaking.com, which is a non-commercial endeavor and really an open source project to try and uh, engage uh, bright minds from across the world in really making this uh, an important part of what needs to be done now. And we can begin wherever we are and invest our time and energy in creating places for people.
wonderful. I'm going to have, I'm going to check it out. <laughs> oh, yeah. Vinita, would you like to finish with a few words? Sure, thank you so much, uh, Simon. That was so brilliantly moderated and I want to thank both the speakers for their, you know, for enormous and prodigious sort of um, you know, number of ideas and uh, certainly there were so many takeaways. Uh, I like what Simon said, uh, coherence from a branding uh, perspective doesn't matter when people take pride in their place. Uh, in, uh, and the brands are stories of people's experience of cities, uh, about the way the city makes you feel. And as more and more humanity travel to cities, uh, settle down in cities, we need to tell better stories about the urban environment. And we try to do that the smart citizen, uh, if not necessarily from the people's perspective, but advising governments on how to uh, govern and innovate in their cities. Um, it's impossible not to take into account the reputation of cities in the context of the global crisis um, triggered by the pandemic and to reimagine how cultural tourism and uh, migrations are going to take place from here on. Uh, so with that, I'd like to close uh, the session and the next edition We'll be turning our gaze to continental Europe, um, so watch out for that uh, in the coming weeks. Thank you so much to all of you.